notre invité spécial. Please help me in welcoming today's very special guest, l'honorable juge Michel Obansowin, the honorable Madam Justice Michel Obansowin. Madame la juge Obansowin, membre de la Chambre des communes et du Sénat, étudiantes et étudiants et autres invités <coughs> dans la salle aujourd'hui, Canadiennes et Canadiens qui écoutez ou regardez à distance, bienvenue. We are gathered here in Ottawa on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people for a truly historic event and we thank you for joining us. Je m'appelle Alain Roussy. Je suis professeur et vice-doyen de la faculté, euh, pardon, du programme de Common Law en français de la faculté de droit, section de Common Law de l'Université d'Ottawa. Et j'ai le très grand honneur d'agir à titre de modérateur pour cette séance d'échange entre, d'une part, l'honorable juge Michel Obansowin de la Cour supérieure de justice de l'Ontario et candidate proposée par le premier ministre pour siéger à la Cour suprême du Canada, et d'autre part, des membres de la Chambre des communes et du Sénat, spécialement réunis pour l'occasion. I want to acknowledge the presence of the following individuals. The Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, the Honorable David Lametti. The Chair of the Independent Advisory Board for Supreme Court of Canada Judicial Appointments, the Honorable Wade McLaughlin. The National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Ms. Roseanne Archibald the President of the Métis National Council, Ms. Ca Cassidy Caron, the Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General of Canada, Mr. François Daigle, and the Commissioner for Federal Judicial Affairs, Monsieur Marc Giroux. La nomination d'une juge à la Cour suprême du Canada est un événement très important dans notre démocratie constitutionnelle. Cette Cour de dernier ressort est non seulement appelée à trancher des litiges sur des questions d'intérêt national, mais elle est également responsable de protéger l'équilibre des compétences constitutionnelles entre les différents paliers de gouvernement et agit comme gardienne des droits et libertés et des droits de la personne qui sont enchastés dans la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés. Respectée partout dans le monde, notre Cour suprême est reconnue pour son indépendance et l'excellence de ses juges. Given the immense responsibility that rests upon the shoulders of the judges of the Supreme Court of Canada. It is crucial that a rigorous process be followed when the time comes to select a new member of that court. In this case, the process was launched by the Prime Minister of Canada on April 4th of this year in light of the upcoming retirement of Justice Michael Moldaver. Justice Moldaver was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada from the Court of Appeal for Ontario. In recognition of the Convention of Regional Representation, the process to select a replacement was open to candidates from the province of Ontario. Since 2016, this process involves the creation of an independent, nonpartisan advisory board whose mandate is to provide a short list of candidates to the Prime Minister for Supreme Court appointments. Cette année, le Comité consultatif indépendant sur la nomination des juges de la Cour suprême du Canada était présidé par l'honorable Wade McLaughlin, ancien premier ministre de l'île du Prince-Édouard, et était composé des membres suivants. Paulette Senior, Conrad Siwi, Charlene Theodore, Jacqueline Horvat, l'honorable Louise Charon, Richard Jockelson et David Nawegabo. The advisory board conducted an evaluation of the candidacies based on the criteria released by the Prime Minister. This long list of criteria includes a superior knowledge of the law, superior analytical skills, 
the ability to resolve complex legal problems, an awareness of and ability to synthesize information about the social context in which legal disputes arise, clarity of thought, an ability to work under significant time pressures in any area of law, a commitment to public service, irreproachable integrity, respect for others, an ability to appreciate a diversity of views, perspective, uh, perspectives, and life experiences, moral courage, discretion, and an open mind. Le gouvernement s'est aussi engagé à nommer des juges à la Cour suprême uniquement si elles sont effectivement bilingues. Finalement, le gouvernement s'est engagé à assurer un équilibre raisonnable entre l'expertise des juges en droit public et en droit privé, à assurer une expertise dans tout sujet précis dont il est régulièrement question à la Cour suprême, ainsi qu'à veiller à ce que les membres de la Cour suprême reflètent raisonnablement la diversité de la société canadienne. After reviewing the applications that were received, the advisory committee provided the prime minister with a short list of eligible candidates. On August 19th of this year, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced the proposed appointment of the Honorable Madam Justice Michelle Obonsawin to the Supreme Court of Canada. She currently serves as a judge of Ontario's Superior Court of Justice. She is an Abenaki member of the Odanak First Nation, making this a truly historic moment for Canada and for Indigenous peoples of Canada in particular. Elle est aussi franco-ontarienne, Et il s'agit donc, une fois de plus, d'un moment extrêmement significatif pour, les fran pour la francophonie ontarienne et pour les francophones du nord de l'Ontario en particulier. Doublement diplômé de la Faculté de droit de l'Université d'Ottawa, il s'agit finalement d'un grand moment de fierté pour notre Faculté de droit et pour son programme de commandement français en particulier. Madame la juge Obansowin, toutes nos félicitations. Madame Justice Obansowin, congratulations. Lors d'une audience spéciale qui a eu lieu plus tôt ce matin, le ministre de la Justice et le président du comité consultatif ont comparu devant le comité permanent de la justice et des droits de la personne de la Chambre des communes pour discuter du processus de sélection et des motifs de la nomination. Le processus de nomination prévoit aussi un forum public d'échange entre la candidate et les parlementaires, et c'est cela qui fait l'objet de cette séance cet après-midi. L'objectif de l'exercice dans lequel nous nous lançons consiste à permettre aux parlementaires et à tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes qui nous écoutent aujourd'hui de faire connaissance avec la candidate proposée par le premier ministre et d'en apprendre un peu plus sur les expériences professionnelles et personnelles qui ont jalonné son parcours et qui l'ont mené jusqu'ici. Today's proceedings are, of course, to be conducted in the highest tradition of civility, respect and restraint being mindful of the primary importance of the principles of judicial independence and impartiality. While Canadians, through their elected representatives, must be able to participate in de democratic decisions, they must also rely on a judiciary that can make decisions that are free of influence and that are based on fact and law. Thus, in the exchange that will follow, parliamentarians are reminded that they should not ask the nominee to comment or take position on issues that may be pending or may arise before the Supreme Court, such that the nominee could be perceived as having prejudged such issues. While it is perfectly acceptable to question the nominee on her responses to the candidate questionnaire, on her understanding of the judicial role or the act of judging, or on how she views the Supreme Court's relationship to the other branches of government, Parliamentarians should refrain from questioning the candidate on her interpretation of specific legislation or regulation, or on hypothetical issues that could be debated before the court. They should not ask the nominee to comment on previous decisions of the Supreme Court, or indeed to comment on or to justify her own past decisions. Likewise, the candidate should not be asked to comment on the nomination process itself. It is my role to make sure that such rules are respected. En bref, les parlementaires devraient profiter de cette opportunité qui leur est donnée d'échanger avec la juge Obansowin afin d'en apprendre davantage sur elle et sur le rôle qui lui est proposé à la Cour suprême. Il est donc possible que je doive t'intervenir à la suite d'une question posée 
pour inviter l'interrogateur ou l'interrogatrice à reformuler sa question afin de préserver la réserve judiciaire requise par la fonction. Je vous remercie donc à l'avance de votre collaboration à cet égard. Now, the session will take place as follows. Justice Obansuin will first make an opening statement of approximately 15 minutes. Then I will invite the members of the House and of the Senate to ask questions following the order which they have all agreed upon. I should mention that this is not a regular meeting of the House of Commons or Senate Standing Committees, and as such, parliamentary privilege does not apply to this special hearing. Parliamentarians will each have a maximum of five minutes to engage into a discussion with Justice Obanswin. To be sure, those five minutes include the question or questions and the answer or answers. I will be responsible for keeping the time, but I am sure that I can count on each and every one of you to assist me in the discharge of that duty. Une fois les parlementaires entendus, la candidate sera invitée à faire un très, euh, une très courte déclaration de clôture avant que je ne marque la fin de la séance à 16h30. J'ai donc maintenant le très grand plaisir de vous présenter l'honorable juge Michel Obansowin, candidate proposée par le premier ministre du Canada pour siéger à la Cour suprême du Canada. Madame la juge. Kwai Kwai Nidobak, Nadeliwizi Miseli Sobansawin, Nadiawi Odanak, Wabanakik Annoba, Ta Plawino Nia. Je me nomme Michel Obansawin et je suis membre de la Première Nation de Danak. Je suis une abénakise du clan de la Tortue. Bonjour, Monsieur le vice-doyen, députés, sénatrices et sénateurs et distingués invités. Good afternoon, Vice Dean. Members of Parliament, Senators, and distinguished guests. C'est un grand honneur pour moi d'être ici parmi vous aujourd'hui. Je me dois pincer de temps en temps pour m'assurer que ce n'est pas un rêve. Déjà comme jeune fille, je voulais être avocate. Durant ma jeunesse, les gens me demandaient ce que je voulais faire plus tard. Puis je leur répondais toujours, je vais être une avocate. Le droit m'attirait dès un très jeune âge. J'ai grandi dans un petit village franco-ontarien nommé Hanmer, tout près de Sudbury. Je suis enfin unique, fille de Richard et Diana Bonsawin. Mon père était machiniste et ma mère enseignante. Mes parents m'ont montré dès un bas âge l'importance de travailler fort et de toujours donner mon 100 peu importe la tâche. C'est ce que j'ai toujours fait d'ailleurs. Comme enfant unique, J'ai été très chanceuse quand mon père vient d'une grande famille de huit enfants, quand mes cousines, qui vivaient à cinq minutes de chez moi, étaient comme mes sœurs et le sont encore aujourd'hui. Cette grande famille est encore une partie très importante dans ma vie. Nous passons toujours beaucoup de beaux temps ensemble, en famille, que ce soit pendant les vacances d'été ou la période des fêtes. À nos réunions de famille, la journée commence habituellement avec un smudge. Ensuite, nous dansons, chantons des chansons à réponse, puis nous passons de très belles journées ensemble. En grandissant en tant que membre d'une Première Nation hors réserve, ma famille a connu l'adversité. Je me souviens d'une conversation très mémorable que j'ai eue avec mon père. Il m'a demandé si les autres enfants riaient de moi à cause j'étais autochtone. Je lui ai dit non. Souvent, il riait plutôt de mon nom, qui était manifestement très différent des autres. Mon père m'a raconté que lorsqu'il était enfant, les autres riaient souvent de lui et de sa famille, puis il l'appelait le petit sauvage de la rue Sunnybury. Pendant mon enfance, je n'ai pas eu l'occasion d'en apprendre autant que j'aurais aimé au sujet de ma, mon héritage à Benaki, car je vivais hors réserve. Cependant, lorsque j'étais adolescente, Le lien entre notre famille et Odanak est devenu encore plus fort. J'ai toujours été très consciente de mon identité autochtone, une identité que j'affirme et qui me représente. Lors de mon cheminement à l'école, j'ai développé davantage ma détermination à faire mon chemin en droit, avec l'appui de ma famille et de certaines autres personnes clés. Cependant, pas tout le monde était du même point de vue. Au secondaire, quand le temps est venu de faire mon choix de carrière, 
je me suis fait dire que, comme petite francophone du nord de l'Ontario, la carrière d'avocate n'était peut-être vraiment pas pour moi. Comme si j'osais de rêver d'une telle carrière et que mon background allait me rendre à réaliser ce rêve. Je me suis dit, « Ah ouais, regardez-moi bien aller. <rire> » J'ai eu le soutien de certaines enseignantes, et je tiens à souligner celui de mon enseignante au secondaire, Claire Fournier, qui m'a toujours encouragée de poursuivre mes rêves. Madame Fournier, merci beaucoup de votre support. Après le secondaire, j'ai fait mon baccalauréat à l'Université Laurentienne à Sudbury. Et en 1995, je suis déménagée à Ottawa pour poursuivre mes études en droit, à Common Law, à, en français, à la Faculté de droit à l'Université d'Ottawa, où j'ai rencontré mon époux. Pendant mes études en droit, je me suis impliquée davantage dans la communauté autochtone. Par exemple, j'ai travaillé comme bénévole à la Clinique d'aide juridique au service aux Autochtones, et j'étais membre des, de l'Association des, des étudiantes et étudiants autochtones. As a law student, I also worked for the minister of the then Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. It was an amazing time since it was during the creation of Nunavut. Afterwards, I worked as a law student at the RCMP Legal Services Department. I joined the team as a lawyer after I completed my bar exams. This unit performed a lot of legal work, legal opinion work to be exact, but my plan was to litigate in Indigenous law. I applied at local firms hoping to get a position because this was an area I was very passionate about. But I have to tell you, I was not successful. I later joined the Legal Services Department at Canada Post Corporation. I have to say I loved my work there. There is a very human side to labour and employment relations. My position allowed me to travel throughout Canada and see the length and breadth of our amazing country. I met people where they lived and worked. My position at Canada Post provided me with a deeper understanding of the links that tie our society together across our country. I was then recruited by the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group because of my experience in, mental, in labour law and I was tasked with creating its legal department. Once I joined the Royal, I realized that there was interesting and stimulating work in mental health law. I was fortunate enough to work with colleagues and professionals who helped me better understand and appreciate the complexity of mental health issues. I was grateful to have been surrounded by a great team, including my assistant, Nicola Tomlinson, who kept me organized and frankly at times she kept the sharks at bay. My work at the Royal has provided me with insight into people who are affected by mental health issues and who are often marginalized. I met daily with psychiatrists, patients, family members and community stakeholders. With the continuing efforts to increase Canadians' awareness of mental health issues and to destigmatize mental illness, my experience has assisted me as a judge to review all cases with an open mind and sensitivity. Institutions such as the Royal provide vital services to our population, which have become even more important in the last two and a half years due to the pandemic. Since the Royal is a teaching hospital, I was able to perform research into mental health legal issues. This provided me with a clearer understanding of the nexus between mental health and the law. My specific research was in the area of mental health law and the possible use of GLADU principles in the forensic mental health context. The forensic mental health system deals with unfit and not criminally responsible accused due to mental illness. GLADU principles require sentencing judges to pay particular attention to the background of the Indigenous accused. These principles have also more recently been used in bail hearings. In 2014, I completed my Master's in Law at Osgoode Hall with a specialty in mental health. During that period, I continued to work full-time as General Counsel at the Royal. I was very involved in its initiatives regarding mental health and Indigenous people. The residential school system impacted survivors and their families in a devastating way. I started speaking at conferences about these issues. 
I was approached to become a member of the University of Ottawa's Board of Governors. My hope was to add an Indigenous voice to that board. I shared my mental health law experience to assist with the emerging, emerging issues faced by students and employees and raise concerns facing Indigenous students' access to post-secondary education. In 2016, I decided to pursue my PhD in law at the University of Ottawa. I was encouraged in October of that year, I was encouraged to apply to the Superior Court of Justice, which had always been an ambition of mine. I submitted my application in May, and in May 2017, I was fortunate enough to be selected for the role. By that time, I had completed my PhD mandatory coursework. I took leave from the program for a period of about two years in order to focus completely on my role as a judge. I will be honest and tell you that as much as it was exciting joining the bench, it was also quite the adjustment. I'm very fortunate that Justice Charles Hackland took me under his wing. I am confident that he was instrumental in my success on the Superior Court of Justice. I have often said that I have stood on the shoulders of giants, and he is definitely one of them. J'ai plus tard décidé de reprendre mon programme de doctorat. C'est une bonne chose que je suis une femme très organisée. Cela m'a été très utile quand j'ai continué à présider à temps plein comme juge. En décembre dernier, j'ai défendu avec su succès ma thèse sur l'utilisation des principes gladus dans le système de psychiatrie légale. Mon superviseur, Juan Veloso, a cru dans mes recherches, même lorsque d'autres se demandaient s'il était possible d'être juge tout en suivant un programme de doctorat. Cela n'a pas été facile à, à réaliser. J'ai dû trouver l'équilibre entre mon travail de juge et mon doctorat tout en essayant d'être la meilleure mère à deux fils et une véritable partenaire pour mon époux. J'espère qu'ils vous diront que j'ai réussi. À la Cour supérieure de justice, j'ai présidé d'une grande variété d'affaires. Au cours des deux dernières années, j'ai siégé plutôt dans les domaines des affaires criminelles, en droit de la, euh, droit de la famille et en protection de l'enfance. Mon expérience passée en tant qu'avocate plaidante m'a été très utile dans mon travail à la Cour. J'espère J'aspire à être décrite comme une juge qui se prépare bien pour ses causes, est attentive, écoute bien, est sympathique et rend des jugements clairs et solides. J'ai également été très impliquée dans l'éducation juridique. Je crois fermement que la formation continue au niveau du judiciaire est nécessaire <rire> excusez, et très importante. Je pense que c'est le temps d'une petite pause d'eau. Je tiens à ajouter que lorsque j'ai commencé à travailler au Royal, la santé mentale faisait l'objet de nombreux préjugés. J'ai constaté une évolution au fil des ans et une diminution de cette stigmatisation. Mais il y a encore beaucoup, beaucoup de chemin à faire. L'un de mes parcours personnels est celui de mon apprentissage de ma langue à Benakis. La pandémie m'a permis de participer à un groupe d'apprentissage pendant plus d'un an. Je me suis ensuite joint à un groupe d'apprenants à Odanak. Along the way, I have been very fortunate that other giants, such as the Honorable Marie Sinclair and Phil Fontaine, have shared with me their wisdom, and have had, we have had great discussions about our strengths as First Nations people. Throughout my life, I have also received wonderful mentorship from elders. When the process began to replace the irreplaceable Justice Moldaver, a number of my friends and colleagues occur encouraged me to apply. I humbly filled out my application in French and in English. I must have reread my submission email at least 10 times before I pressed that send button because I was so afraid to have made a mistake. I was overjoyed when I received the call advising me that I had been selected for an interview with the advisory committee. At that moment, I became that nine-year-old girl again. 
Je suis ici avec vous et je vous dis avec humilité que j'espère que mon vécu particulier en tant que franco-ontarienne, mère autochtone et mes expériences de travail comme avocate et juge pourront contribuer d'une façon positive à la Cour suprême du Canada. Every nominee to the Supreme Court has followed a different path to get there. And I hope my different path will allow it to make a lasting contribution to the court. On a deeper personal note, I'm going to give you some fun facts about myself. My husband is an engineer and a lawyer. I have two sons. They are, that I, I have to say, I'm extremely proud of them. And they're both artists in their own way. They are really the three most important people in my life. We have three dogs, Max, Pixie, and Zorro. You've heard me right, three dogs. For all you cat lovers out there, rest assured, I have nothing against cats. And in fact, I've been asking for one for quite a while. And my husband keeps saying that it's not a good idea because of his allergies. But I think that we're going to keep working on him. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to mention, we also have eight chickens and a gecko named Lizzie. <laughs> I'm also a painter. And this is a hobby that I've enjoyed with my father that we started out together when I was a teenager. I love to read, and when time permits, I love to sneak in a little round of golf. Donc, avec ça, je suis prête à répondre à vos questions. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Juge. Uh, donc, on va maintenant passer à la, la période de, de questions. So, just a Friendly reminder of the uh, five minutes uh, that we all have at our disposal for those uh, in the room, because as we will soon see, uh, this will be a, a really kind of a post-pandemic uh, kind of session in the sense that we, we will have approximately half of our uh, questioners in the room and half of our questioners online. Uh, for those in the room, you can see uh, the time right in front of um, your noses. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, the first questioner will be Senator Mobina Jaffer, who is the chair of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, uh, joining us uh, online, virtually. Senator Jaffer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madame la juge, au bon samin. Je tiens Je tiens tout d'abord à vous souhaiter la bienvenue à Ottawa et à vous féliciter sincèrement de votre nomination à la Cour suprême du Canada. Cool. Madame la Bonne Savane, how do you believe that Canada's most vulnerable populations benefit from feeling, seeing, and heard to the Supreme Court's decisions. Perhaps you could explain as well your vision of equity versus equality in Canadian society. Just one moment, please. I'm just wondering, is it possible to see the members on the screen in front of me when they speak? We'll try, we'll, try to get that. we'll try to get that fixed. For, for the moment, uh, we can see them on the left and the right, but uh, okay. ide ideally, we will see them right in the center as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I can see you. Um, I think it's very important for people who have issues with mental illness to be seen and heard. It impacts so many in our population, and I'm sure many of us here know someone who's been impacted by mental illness, either personally or as members of their family uh, and uh, friends. Um, I think that in order for them to be part of society and to feel involved, it's important for them, as you said, to be seen and heard. And that's all part of inclusivity, and it's part of our charter values about having equality and dignity. Uh, with regard to uh, equity versus equality, um, it, these are all principles that are very important related to the Charter. And again, uh, what I would say that people who are affected by mental illness need to be supported throughout our community because at the end of the day, everyone is value added and we can never forget that. So I would say that um, 
we always have to remember our charter values and make sure that we're a very inclusive society. Um, ma Madame, La, Madame uh, Judge uh, Bonsavant, you know, you have spoken the difference between equality and equity. And I would like you to share our vision of what, what you mean in the difference between treating people equally or with equity. Well, I think that everyone has to be treated equal under the law. And that I, I've spoken about when uh, I was asked that question in my application. Um, when I think of um, equality, I would think that that's protected under Section 15 of the, uh, the Charter. And it's something that we should all aspire to achieve as part of members of our society, Canada, throughout. Um, with regards to, to the issue of equity, I think they go hand in hand. And that, um, I, I, I think that's all that I have to say about that issue. So I want to ask you also about, given your exp expertise with GLADU principles and your doctorate, how do you think should be incorporated into our judges' training at continuing education training, the GLADU principles, GLADU training. You've talked in your questionnaire about the different training you think should take place, but I'm interested in how you think would GLADU principles be incorporated in judges' training? I think it's essential, and I've been a strong proponent about talking about GLADU principles. I've been invited to speak at many conferences about this issue. And um, whenever either C the CIAJ or the NJI ask me to attend, I'm always a willing participant. Because at the end of the day, we all have a responsibility as sentencing judges, judges who also do bail hearings, uh, under the criminal code to apply, um, the, to look at the background of Indigenous accused when they appear in front of us. Because it's that understanding that's required for judges to be able to make a fulsome decision by looking at the facts, what's in front of us as uh, the issue, but also looking at the particular background of those Indigenous accused. So I, I always said it's extremely necessary, and I think it's, uh, it should be something that we're constantly striving to achieve, to be fair when these people in, appear in front of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Jaffer. Um, the next question goes to um, MP Randeep Sarai, who is the chair of the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Lane. Uh, Rossi, uh, just hours before, during our Standing Committee of Justice meeting on this nomination process, the nomination of Justice uh, Michelle Boswin was described as landmark, historic, and episodic, and that to a group of elected parliamentarians. However, as a young South Asian being born to immigrant parents in the late 70s, I've witnessed a lot in the past 40 years. Always a dreamer and an optimist, I always believed that Canada would be a place where everyone felt welcomed and is a part of the fabric. But I also never realized the daunting challenges that it faced in terms of reconciliation and healing. But I believe the future is a lot brighter. Just look at us today. We have a South Asian Muslim senator who heads the Justice uh, and Constitutional Affairs Committee, a Sikh member of parliament who's the Standing Committee of Justice chair. And if you look at this room, the abundance and variety is even more abundant. And we have a nominee that is uh, nominated by an Italian Canadian Attorney General. And if I went around this room, it would even be broader. So Justice O'Bronson, as a trilingual woman, Abenaki member of the Odnak First Nation, mother of two, how do you think your life experience and background will assist you in the role as Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada? Well, I'm hoping that my background, because I, I am an Indigenous person, I'm a Franco-Ontarian, I grew up in a very small uh, rural community, um, I'm hoping that all that life experience will bring me a unique perspective that hopefully is going to be beneficial to the Supreme Court of Canada. I also think that um, my professional experience in mental health law and uh, my extensive research that I perform for my PhD uh, with regard to uh, the use of GLADU principles um, and if it's possible to apply them in the forensic mental health setting 
So I, I, what I would say is I would hope that this experience, both background personal and also my professional experience in mental health, uh, indigenous issues, and also the perspective of the labor and employment that has that human value to it, um, is something that's unique to me and uh, would be beneficial to uh, myself on the court and hopefully uh, to the court as a whole. Thank you. You've also accomplished a lot in a short period of time. You've become a lawyer, a justice, a mother, uh, you completed your master's and PhD all at the same time, and you've had mentors along the way. But how do you see yourself mentoring others uh, who, who may come from rural, remote, or underrepresented uh, communities in Canada? I really think mentorship is the key. I've always had mentors throughout my career. From when I started at Canada Post, I had great labor mentors and, and them there. When I joined the Royal, I had uh, great people who showed me how to work the forms because this is a very complex uh, issue and an external counsel that helped me along the way on our court as I spoke of, of Justice Hackland. And I, because I've had that mentorship, I've always thought it was important to share that with the youth and with the either uh, the students or the junior lawyers. And I've really done that throughout my career because I think that we share with them to hopefully um, help give them and share our insight and experience, but we also learn from them. And I think that uh, we all have perspectives to share and I think mentorship is really very important at every stage of your life. It's not only when you're first a lawyer, because I've always said, see, I've had a mentor when I started law, when I moved into labor and employment, when I moved into mental health, the Superior Court, and um, it's really just made me a better person. So I, I hope to do that for others, and I, I have done so for quite a while. Thank you. As, uh, as the first Indigenous woman judge appointed to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice in Ottawa, did you face any challenges when applying to the bench? No, I have to say, to be honest, I didn't face any challenges. Uh, I think that I, I met the requirements because um, I had my 10 years uh, of uh, experience as counsel. I think it was uh, helpful to me because I was bilingual and sitting in Ottawa as a very bilingual city was helpful. And I had um, uh, something I, I think a bit different to bring to the court with my mental health experience and my, my criminal background in uh, forensic mental health. So um, to be honest, I, I didn't face barriers. Thank you. I think I'm out of time, but I, again, want to wish you, you and congratulate you on this uh, momentous appointment. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sarai. Je inviterai maintenant le sénateur Pierre Dalfon à prendre la parole. Merci. Kouai, Madame la juge. D'abord, je voudrais vous féliciter pour votre parcours. À 9 ans, vous avez dit à vos parents que vous rêviez d'être une avocate. Et voilà, vous êtes, vous êtes allé à l'école de droit de l'Université d'Ottawa en common law, en français. En deuxième année à la faculté de droit de l'Université d'Ottawa, vous avez assisté à une conférence donnée par le commissaire à la magistrature fédérale qui, en réponse à une question qui n'était pas de vous, mais d'une autre personne, a déclaré que la juge idéale serait une personne, serait une femme bilingue avec des, des, des origines autochtones. Vous avez commencé à rêver de devenir juge. En 2017, vous avez été nommé juge à la Cour supérieure de l'Ontario. En 2019, dans le cadre d'une entrevue avec la télé, télé Ontario français, vous avez parlé d'un autre rêve, être juge à la Cour suprême du Canada. Aujourd'hui, vous voilà recommandé par le comité aviseur et proposé par le premier ministre pour la Cour suprême à 46 ans, au même âge que l'a été la très honorable Beverly McLaughlin. Madame la juge, quel est votre prochain rêve? <rire> je, dois, je dois être corrigée et dire que j'ai 48, donc j'ai pas 46. <rire> Un petit peu plus vieille. Souvent, tu veux toujours dire que tu es, es plus jeune, plus jeune, mais quand tu es juge à un bout, c'est toujours mieux de l'air un petit peu plus vieille. <rire> euh, mon, mon prochain rêve, c'est vraiment euh, d'avoir le plaisir, si possible, de joindre la Cour suprême, euh, faire le meilleur travail que je puisse en ajoutant ma voix. Euh, avec euh, mes expériences personnelles dont je vous ai parlé, euh, dans mon expérience professionnelle, euh, puis travailler avec mes collègues pour rendre des décisions qui sont justes, puis bonnes pour euh, les Canadiennes et Canadiens. Donc, c'est vraiment mon... J'atteins mon rêve. 
je vais commencer par espérant faire le premier, puis ensuite, je vais peut-être penser à quelque chose d'autre plus tard, mais vraiment, je vis le moment, puis euh, je me compte très, très chanceuse d'être ici parmi vous aujourd'hui. Merci pour cette réponse. Ma deuxième question, euh, les tribunaux ne participent pas au processus politique, mais parfois, il est difficile d'établir une distinction claire entre le droit et les politiques. Euh, Peter Hogg a parlé d'un dialogue entre la, les parlements et les tribunaux, en particulier la Cour suprême du Canada. Quelle est votre vision du dialogue entre les, le Parlement et la Cour suprême? Moi, pour être honnête, je dois dire que c'est un peu limité, parce qu'on a chacun notre rôle à jouer. Donc, vous, comme parlementaire, vous avez un rôle plus législatif, euh, niveau social aussi. Nous, comme juristes, c'est différent parce que nous interprétons ces lois-là. On sait ça moins dans les normes euh, sociales, je dirais. Donc, euh, je pense qu'il y a quand même une distinction assez claire à faire entre les deux. Puis, euh, moi, comme juge, c'est important pour moi d'être venu comme quelqu'un qui est impartial, puis que, qui va regarder un dossier, puis faire une décision basée sur le fond de l'affaire. Donc, euh, je pense vraiment, euh, je vais continuer à faire mon rôle, puis vous pourrez continuer à faire la vôtre. <rire> <rire> ben, je pense que c'est une excellente réponse. Et je dois dire que je me réjouis du fait que vous êtes la première femme qui a, une, qui a eu fait de la common law en français, à la Cour suprême, la première femme autochtone. Et je pense que le Canada a beaucoup d'attentes à, vo à votre égard, et je pense que nous allons en, en apprécier beaucoup votre contribution. Merci. Mais, merci. Merci beaucoup, euh, Sénateur Dalfon. Um, we are going back online now. The next uh, questioner is MP Rob Moore. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, to you, Justice. Uh, congratulations, number one, on your appointment. This is a, a huge appointment, and uh, we know the important role of the Supreme Court of Canada plays. Um, we know their decisions have an impact on all Canadians. So I congratulate you, number one, on your appointment, and I wish you very well uh, in your deliberations, which will be over uh, the next uh, many number of years. So um, you've spoken about access to justice and uh, your your life experience, you've, you've seen uh, issues around access to justice. Um, in particular, uh, this is something uh, uh, near and dear to, to my heart, but could you comment uh, your perspective on um, on access to justice and uh, victims uh, contact with the justice system and how, how judges uh, can help facilitate a system that um, all Canadians uh, see themselves in, particularly victims. All right, so that's a loaded question. I've broken it down into really three categories. So I'll start off with um, access to justice. I think that we've seen a huge improvement, to be honest, in the last uh, couple of years because of the pandemic. Mm. It's created access to many Canadians to have access to justice because now a lot of uh, court processes, court filings can be done by uh, electronic means. Uh, is it a perfect process? Absolutely not. Uh, there remains a many Canadians that do not have access to electronic means to be able to have that. Um, I think uh, there are issues with access to justice that have to be looked at, which are, are social issues, and a lot of it has to do with uh, monetary issues and poverty, but that I'll lead for the legislators to deal with some of that. Um, with regard to victims, they definitely do have a role to play. As you know, they have a charter um, they have a right to be heard. So when we do criminal trials, uh, there are provisions in the criminal code that permits them uh, to appear in front of us to uh, provide us with um, their declarations. But let me just step back. When they appear in front of us, uh, there are provisions under the code that, prevent, uh, that do provide uh, that, for example, screens could be up so that when the person testifies, um, she or he will not see the accuser. Uh, so norms could be put in place, and I think as a judge, a sitting judge in criminal court, I'm conscious of that and I'm mindful because we have to be conscientious of those things. Um, they also have a right when it comes time to sentencing to provide us 
with a victim impact statement. And those, uh, I can assure you, are considered closely uh, when we're sitting on sentencing. Um, and how can we facilitate these issues? Well, it's to be mindful of it. I think uh, continuing education is always the key. I know that the National Judicial Institute and the CIAJ do a lot of uh, work to put programming together to ensure that judges, especially those sitting in uh, criminal justice files, uh, do take into consideration the issues of, of uh, victims' rights and uh, the obligations that we have towards them under the criminal code. Thank you for that. And uh, quickly, I, I only have a minute left, so I'll try to ask this quickly, but uh, you, um, in your application, you stated a judge must remain free of influence or pressure, must not engage in public discussions regarding matters before the court and avoid commenting on political issues. But we do know from time to time, sitting judges are invited to, for example, write articles and make speeches on general legal policy issues. What um, parameters do you see should be in place or should be exercised by sitting judges, including yourself, what should uh, be imposed on yourselves in making uh, speeches or writing articles as you now embark on this, uh, on this new appointment? Well, we have ethical pro uh, protocols that we have to follow. And in there, it's very clear that we're st to stay clear of commenting on uh, issues that may arrive before the court. So I think that, um, I, we're all independent as judges, so I don't want to comment for others, but myself, I know that uh, I'm mindful of the idea of uh, what's within my toolbox and my uh, playground, and I know that I could speak about certain things, and there are others that I cannot because they're before the courts. So it's really an individual call depending on what the issue is that we're speaking about. Thank you, and uh, congratulations Thank once you very again. Much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore. So uh, we are coming back into the room. Uh, the next person is MP Jaime Batiste. Gwe. Uh, I, was, I was really proud to hear you start off with your first few words in your Abenaki language. As, as a Mi'kmaq uh, person, I was able to understand a lot of it. We share uh, the same way to say greetings. We're also linked by the Treaty of 1725 and the Wabanaki uh, Confederacy. And, uh, I'm deeply honored uh, to be able to be able to ask questions as an Indigenous person for the first time to an Indigenous nominee, uh, and uh, that's a great moment for Canada, I believe. Uh, my question is about uh, legal pluralism. Uh, all across law schools in in this country, we learn that you know we have we have a common law, we have civil law, and we also have Indigenous laws. What do you feel is how does your nomination to the Supreme Court help promote and uh, shape Indigenous laws in this country? Well, I could tell you, I, I'm a judge first and an Indigenous person and a mother and a Franco-Ontarian afterwards. So I think that um, what's important for, for me to remember is my roots and the voice that I bring my life experience, but also my uh, background as someone who's worked in mental health law, uh, indigenous issues, and also in, in labor and employment and human rights. So um, I can't comment much further about what kind of a, a role these issues could play because it's something that definitely, I think, uh, is on its way to the Supreme Court of Canada. But I could tell you that um, I have my voice as one of nine uh, judges. Hopefully, hopefully I'll have one of nine voices on that bench. So let's just be clear. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I can't say much more than that. Dur during the questionnaire part of, of your uh, interview, you had mentioned that the important role that judges play, uh, the decisions may help uh, protect vulnerable populations. In an era where we're seeing uh, the calls to justice from the missing and murdered Indigenous women, and we realize in Canada that uh, Indigenous women have been perhaps uh, the most marginalized and, and one of the most victimized uh, people in, in Canada, I'm wondering what you feel the importance of for Indigenous women 
out there to see you now as a nominee uh, at this level and what do you think that it is going to do for not just Indigenous women in Canada but for those young Indigenous women who you mentioned as, as a nine-year-old yourself were uh, dreaming of this, to see this in person today, what do you think it means to them? Well, I, I'm hoping it's going to inspire them because I come from a very small rural area where I was told, oh, Michelle, you're not going to be, a, you're not, likely not going to be a lawyer because you come from this small uh, town in northern Ontario. But at the end of the day, if you work hard and your heart's in it, um, you could go and do what you want. And I'm hoping that young people, female, indigenous w women also, um, will see that anything is possible if you, you set your mind to it and you surround yourself with great people because I've stood on, as I said, the shoulders of giants throughout my life. They've helped propel me up and I think that's really made a difference. So I'm hoping some will feel inspired. In the last minute of a, a question that I have, questions that I have, I'm wondering if you could talk to some of the key Indigenous teachings that you've received in your life uh, that have helped shape where you are today. I think being humble, which is the first one, um, it's really important to recognize our place where we're at in the world because um, we have to work our way throughout life by remembering who we are and what our roots are. And no matter where we are in society and how, we, how far we move up, we always have to remember where we come from. Um, I think honesty um, has always been extremely important in my life. I'm a tell it as it is person. I don't sugarcoat things. And uh, I've really learned that from my roots, how it's important to be uh, honest and uh, to be compassionate and to love others how we want to be loved. I only have 20 seconds, so <laughs> I, I'll say that and just say uh, walal in, in, my, in, in our Mi'kmaq language, uh, walal yek, for all of us who hoped and dreamed that this day was possible for to see an Indigenous nominee and to, to hear you today uh, just as, as an Indigenous person and as an Indigenous person who was part of the Indigenous Bar Association, uh, just how proud you've made us uh, today. Uliuni. Thank you very much, Mr. Batiste. Uh, the next... Um, Question comes from Senator Peter Harder here in the room. Good afternoon, uh, Judge. I wrote in my book after you finished your opening comments, so normal and so exceptional. <laughs> and I think that those are the characteristics that uh, have come through in your questions and responses. And I thank you for that. I'd like you to comment a little bit on the expectations uh, that Canadians generally and certainly Indigenous Canadians have with respect to your nomination uh, and the priority uh, that so many of us share in terms of the uh, calls to action of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. Uh, there are a number that speak directly to justice and legal issues. I won't go into them in detail, you know them, but I'm particularly interested in the role that you think justice uh, and judges can play in uh, promoting reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples? I think it's to start by having the conversation. Because I always tell people, if you want to learn about reconciliation, you got to start by knowing our history and looking at the executive summary of the TRC. So I always tell everyone, that's the first place to start. And um, I think that by going through that understanding, that personal understanding, then we could set in motion responses to the TRC. And I'm, uh, I'm, one, I'm but one person, hopefully, of a, a nine-member uh, court. But uh, I think education is the key. I think talking about the issues, because at one point, uh, everything was uh, more hidden. We didn't talk about residential schools and the intergenerational impact that this had on our, our uh, family members and our, our friends. and and um, the impacts that it had on mental illness. So I think to have that active discussion, I think that's a very direct response to the TRC recommendation. And then it's for uh, legislature, legislators and society as a whole to try to implement movement forward. Thanks so much. Just a follow-up question. In your time on the Superior Court of Ontario, 
how did being indigenous and coming with a perspective on indigenous uh, law in particular uh, affect your role? I think it was definitely beneficial because I think that um, coming back to my my comment to um, Mr. Batiste about being humble and about uh, recognizing what's important in individuals' backgrounds because uh, to be honest, in Ottawa, we didn't have a lot of Gladue type cases because that's before the provincial court. There's an Indigenous Persons Court. But I think that uh, my own teachings as an indig Indigenous young woman have helped me along the way. And um, I would hope that people would say as a judge that I, I'm compassionate, I listen, uh, and um, I make sound judgment. So. Final question is, uh, do you believe that Indigenous laws and traditions, legal traditions, uh, can make an increasing and important contribution to Canada's pluralistic law, uh, legal system? Uh, and how do you see that evolving in the course of what will be, uh, at least on paper, a fairly long time on the bench? Mm -hmm. uh, how will the pluralism of Canada's legal system adopt and incorporate uh, as a result of, of your participation? I have to say it's a bit difficult for me to comment on something like that because it's definitely I think something that's going to come into the courts and possibly into the Supreme Court of Canada system so unfortunately I can't say much more than what I've said to you already. But by your references to the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action uh, there are some clear guidance there that uh, we can all uh, reference in the work ahead. Yeah, yeah, because there there are separations. When you look at the recommendations, they're separated. There and there's a clear section on justice initiatives and how those could be put forward. And I think everyone has a role to play, from the court system to the legislators to society as a whole. Well, again, I congratulate you and, and look forward to your appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Harder. La prochaine personne à poser la question, c'est le député Rial Fortin. Merci, M. Roussy. Madame la juge, mes plus sincères félicitations. Je peux vous confirmer que nous accueillons avec beaucoup d'enthousiasme votre arrivée à la Cour suprême et je suis convaincu que votre contribution sera significative pour l'ensemble des citoyens qui sont assujettis à la Cour suprême. Euh, vous avez dit dans votre introduction que vous rêviez d'être une juge, je ne me souviens pas exactement du détail, mais ouverte, attentive, claire et sympathique. Alors, vous pouvez cocher sur sympathique. Je pense que c'est fait. Merci. <rire> Ceci dit, Madame le juge, j'ai beaucoup de questions que j'aimerais vous adresser, mais que malheureusement, j'ai peur qu'elles qu ne soient pas recevables compte tenu des circonstances. Mais je vais quand même tenter d'explorer certains domaines qui me tiennent à cœur. Et je vous, évidemment, je, je m'en remettrai à votre décision si vous croyez qu'il n'est pas opportun d'y répondre. Ma première question s'adresserait à la question des langues officielles. On sait qu'au euh, Canada, le français et l'anglais sont les deux langues officielles. On sait également que euh, les, les, les langues autochtones sont des langues auxquelles nous tenons, parce que ça constitue une, esp une espèce de trésor ou de, de un trésor culturel qu'on qu ne veut pas perdre. Et en tout cas, je peux vous dire que euh, dans mon parti politique, on est sensible à cette question-là, mais ça pose un certain nombre de défis. Et j'aimerais que vous me parliez de comment vous voyez euh, cette question-là des, des langues autochtones par rapport aux deux langues officielles devant la Cour suprême. Euh, la juge, justement, comme vous l'avez dit vous-même, M. Euh, Fortin, il est, il est possible que Mme la juge soit un peu limitée dans les commentaires qu'elle puisse offrir à, à votre question, mais elle a peut-être des commentaires euh, généraux qu'elle peut, qu peut faire sur, la, <rire> sur les enjeux que vous soulevez. Um, je peux parler de, de mon expérience, puis comment la revitalisation des langues autochtones est importante. Puis je sais dans ma communauté à Donac, c'est très important. Puis moi, comme mon propre projet personnel, j'ai entrepris d'apprendre ma langue à Benakis. Quant au sujet de comparaître devant les tribunaux, euh, je peux dire qu'il y a toujours la question d'interprétation que je sache est disponible. Autrement, je ne peux pas dire grand autre chose à ce sujet. 
Et euh, le sénateur Harder a adressé la question précédente à laquelle vous avez également dit qu'il serait difficile de répondre clairement sur les traditions autochtones. Et je comprends que ce soit difficile pour vous. Vous ne pouvez pas vous prononcer à l'avance oui. sur des questions qui pourraient être soumises à la Cour. On le comprend tous. Mais quand même, euh, pour nous, euh, en tout cas pour moi, dans, dans la communauté d'où je viens, on a toujours euh, un peu mis sur un piédestal l'espèce de sagesse des, 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 euh, des Autochtones sur euh, différentes questions d'ordre euh, légal. Et j'aimerais savoir, de, de votre côté, comment, comment, vous, comment nous pourrions intégrer certaines de ces traditions autochtones à l'intérieur du cadre législatif canadien? Est-ce que c'est possible ou pas? Et si oui, de quelle façon? Ça, encore, c'est un peu difficile à répondre, mais je peux dire que euh, de mon point de vue, euh, tous peuvent travailler avec un aîné parce qu'à la fin de la journée, apprendre au sujet des traditions puis des cultures, ça vient de nos aînés. Puis à, à tous les niveaux de la société, on peut apprendre en rencontrant un aîné pour vraiment recevoir les enseignements qu'ils nous ont à apprendre. Mais autre que ça, je ne pense pas que je peux ajouter d'autres choses. Désolée. <rire> Merci, Madame le juge. Euh, J'aimerais aussi aborder euh, tellement d'autres questions. Euh, L'accès à la justice, évidemment, la formation des, des juges. On en a parlé beaucoup au comité de justice. C'est quelque chose qui me préoccupe. Euh, la, la représentation, on a de plus en plus de citoyens qui ne sont pas représentés par avocats et qui se retrouvent devant les tribunaux. Ça apporte des défis importants, euh, importants pour le, le, les juges qui siègent et qui doivent gérer... Euh, un débat entre individus qui n'ont pas les mêmes connaissances de base sur, le, sur la, la procédure juridique. Donc, c'est toutes des questions qui m'apparaissent importantes. Il me reste même plus 30 secondes, mais je vais m'attarder sur une seule. C'est par rapport à, euh, au Code civil du Québec. Vous savez, évidemment, j'en suis certain qu'au Québec, nous, le droit civil est régi par le Code civil du Québec, contrairement aux autres provinces où on parle de la « common law ». Alors, euh, comme, euh, quelles sont vos connaissances par rapport au Code civil du Québec et comment vous euh, comptez intégrer ces principes de droit-là dans votre pratique en tant que juge? Je vais être honnête. Euh, je suis très limitée en connaissances euh, en droit civil. Moi, j'ai fait mes cours euh, en common law à tous les niveaux, en droit, ma maîtrise, puis mon doctorat. Euh, mais je peux m'engager maintenant devant vous et tous ceux ici que si je suis choyée d'être nommée euh, à la Cour suprême, que je vais apprendre euh, puis faire mon devoir. Parce qu'à la fin de la journée, il y a trois collègues qui siégeront euh, ou qui siègent à la Cour suprême, qui sont experts dans ce domaine-là, puis que je m'attends de… qui vont m'aider à me guider dans cette question pour que moi-même, je puisse faire mes propres apprentissages parce que moi, je suis une étudiante de la vie. Comme vous voyez, j'étudie puis j'apprends continuellement. Merci, Madame le juge. Et félicitations encore. Merci. Merci, M. Fortin. On passe maintenant à la sénatrice René Dupuis, qui est en ligne. Merci, M. le modérateur. Félicitations, Madame la juge Obomsawin. Je suis convaincue que votre détermination va être une source d'inspiration et d'espoir pour beaucoup de femmes plus jeunes et de jeunes filles euh, canadiennes. Euh, et donc, je vous en remercie. Ma question, euh, elle a trait à la partie 10 du questionnaire où on vous interrogeait sur la fonction judiciaire. Et vous parliez des croyances, je, je cite, « Les croyances dans d'autres régions du monde ne peuvent influencer ou affecter la façon dont notre Constitution sera interprétée et appliquée aux Canadiens, qui doit l'être indépendamment de la présence d'éventuelles forces extérieures. » Je pense que votre phrase est claire. Ma question porte plutôt sur les jugements des tribunaux des autres États, par exemple les autres pays du Commonwealth, euh, dans l'interprétation des droits constitutionnels, par exemple des droits reconnus et confirmés aux peuples autochtones au Canada. Est-ce qu'à votre avis, il y a un rôle, euh, les jugements des États étrangers peuvent jouer un rôle dans l'interprétation qu'on fait de ces droits-là ici et que vous aurez à faire comme juge de la Cour suprême Madame la juge soit un peu limitée dans les commentaires qu'elle euh, qu offre à, à votre question, Madame la sénatrice, mais elle peut euh, probablement nous fournir des commentaires généraux sur la question. Je peux dire que ça dépend vraiment du dossier qui est présent devant le tribunal. Puis, euh, 
C'est une question vraiment à déterminer cas par cas. Quel rôle qu'ils peuvent jouer à ce moment-ci? Je ne peux pas ajouter un commentaire parce que c'est des questions qui peuvent comparaître devant les tribunaux, puis je ne peux pas préjuger euh, une telle affaire. Donc, vous n'excluez pas, si je comprends bien, euh, que des, des jugements de d'autres pays puissent avoir un rôle à jouer ou puissent avoir une certaine utilité. Vous ne l'excluez pas par principe. Je, ni, je dis ni non et ni oui à la fin de la Merci. journée. Euh... <rire> Mon autre question porte sur une réponse que vous avez donnée, toujours dans la même partie 10, à la question 3, sur le rôle d'un juge dans une démocratie constitutionnelle. Vous dites qu'un juge doit faire preuve une juge doit faire preuve de grande compétence pour atteindre l'équilibre délicat entre les besoins du public et les droits de l'individu. Est-ce que vous pourriez préciser, je n'étais pas certaine de bien comprendre ce que vous voulez dire par les besoins du public. Qu'est-ce que vous pouvez préciser ce que vous voulez dire dans cette phrase-là? Moi, je dirais que c'est vraiment pour balancer entre les deux. Donc, l'individu versus n'importe quoi qui n'est pas un individu, ça, c'est pour moi le public. Ça peut, ça peut être institutionnel, ça peut être un groupe, donc ça peut être euh, n'importe quoi qui est varié, qui n'est pas un individu. Je m'excuse, euh, peut-être mon, mon langage n'était pas assez clair dans mon formulaire, mais à la fin de la journée, c'est toujours à balancer euh, par l'entremise d'une évaluation de la charte euh, où est-ce que ces, ces valeurs tombent. Donc, c'était le terme « les besoins du public » que vous mettiez en opposition avec les droits de l'individu. Donc, c'est, euh, je me demandais pourquoi le terme besoin, euh, et si je comprends bien, c'est euh, quand un litige met en, en présence les droits d'un individu par rapport à l'ensemble de la situation sociale, c'est ça dont on parle. Oui. Merci, félicitations encore. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Sénatrice. Um, la, the next uh, question goes uh, back here in the room to uh, MP Laurie Idlow. Yenami, si vous voulez me accueillir au pays du Mavagit, pilier à ces maillotes, accueillir au pays qu'on accueille, t'accompagner à tout le temps. Amaro, ne réunions mais amis se marierons ne tenez ces magasins qu'il y a rivagit. I wanted to first. Mm. Thank you very much. I wanted to congratulate you. Can you add, can you give me back my five minutes? I, I'm going to translate what I just said. Non, juste qu'on n'a pas d'interprétation. Je voulais simplement le mentionner. Ah, désolé. Can you give me back my five minutes? Oui, on peut remettre un peu de temps sur l'horloge, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup. Koyanami, sivodlongmi, aksuara upigi yumavagi, pilirea resimayati, pikkonang mata, Amaru takumi nakshutit, amaru nireum nirme tunisisi magavit angi yuarumi. I wanted to first congratulate you on this momentous occasion, this historic occasion. Uh, I admire your work, and you are a role model to so many, to so many indigenous women, especially, uh, knowing that we live in a world where there are too many missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, you've given so many hope uh, to so many indigenous peoples in Canada. So I'm very uh, proud of you for what you've achieved. Um, I wanted to give a bit of a context before I ask my first question. Uh, Inuit, First Nations, and Métis have lived on these lands since time immemorial. Indigenous peoples have thrived with indigenous laws. Uh, about 155 years ago, colonialism took hold, and we now live in this country called Canada. We now live in a bijural system. During the process of colonialism, the courts that have appointed you have compartmentalized the indigenous inherent rights to thrive into uh, land, title, and human rights. Uh, your, uh, your appointment opens the space that's needed to ensure that the court's legitimacy is strengthened to a pluralistic legal system at the highest level. How will you, as an Indigenous justice, work with the Supreme Court of Canada to lead in the potential for Canada to be in a pluralistic legal system that reconciles with Indigenous laws of which have purposefully been ignored and hidden. In other words, how will you ensure that Indigenous laws are seen and heard? 
Oyanami. Uni, for your question. Um, I am a voice at the table. I bring my background as an Indigenous mother of, of two sons and, uh, and everything that comes back, I guess, with all of my background. So what I can tell you is um, I, I live my traditions. I bring these tra traditions and my, um, my heritage to the table. Um, I'm a voice of, hopefully, a voice of nine whereas um, we make our decisions based on the file that's in front of us and the facts and the law that's as it's presented. But uh, I can tell you that uh, I do bring my voice as an Indigenous person, and, and that's what I, I have to offer in addition to my own um, experiences and also as my uh, work experience. And, and I think especially in my my research into um, GLADU principles and how they apply to sentencing, and I hope that that experience um, is going to be helpful to the court. And also on the mental health aspect, because as we know, our communities were deeply affected by residential schools and, and uh, related issues, and there's intergenerational trauma that has affected the mental illness of our brothers and sisters, so I think um, it's to be mindful of that and, and to bring that experience to the court. Uh, my final question is about Indigenous languages and where it could sit within uh, the, the, uh, at the highest of our courts. Uh, this morning during our hearing, uh, I had asked a question in my language uh, as a person with my, uh, and my question was not properly interpreted. Uh, into English, and I wasn't able to correct that question. And I think that's going, that is a, often a reality that is experienced by uh, individuals in the court system who have non-Indigenous lawyers uh, that don't understand them fully. What role do you think the Supreme Court can do to make sure that Indigenous-speaking uh, people in the justice system are better heard uh, in terms of seeking justice? I think it's a bit difficult to provide an answer to that question per se, but I could tell you that um, uh, in my experience on our court, uh, we have translation services. I saw this morning, unfortunately, it didn't work out in your situation, and I would hope that um, if uh, we appear in front of courts with our language that we would have proper translation. Thank you, Ms. Islaut, uh, Idlaut, sorry. Um, next um, questioner is uh, Senator Kim Pate. Thank you, very Thank you very much and welcome, congratulations. I've heard in the last uh, few days from many, many Indigenous women all across the country at all levels and uh, there's a lot of weight on those shoulders that sit in before us. And as I want to follow up on uh, some of what was just raised by previous MPs and my colleagues, Senators, and this morning, Minister Lametti spoke about the importance of the incorporation of the application of Indigenous laws and traditions and the need to ensure that we do build a more pluralistic legal system. As we move forward in the spirit of reconciliation, in light of the calls to action that you've referenced and many others have of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as well as the calls for justice from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, as well as the stated objective of this government to reduce mass incarceration of Indigenous women, particularly in light of the reality that now uh, and over the past four decades, every effort to reform the system has paradoxically resulted in inadequate protection and support for those very Indigenous women who have experienced victimization and the results of colonial racism, in addition to the astronomical increase in the rates of incarceration of Indigenous women in particular, to the point that they now represent half of federally sentenced women serving two years or more, three quarters and more of the, serv the women serving provincial sentences, particularly in the Prairie region, and an astronomical 95 to 100 percent of the young women and girls in the youth system in the Prairie provinces and northern territories. What is your view of the role and importance of the judiciary in remedying these wrongs by decolonizing current approaches? including by ensuring the application of Indigenous laws and traditions. Well, I'll start off by recognizing the number 
uh, I think it was Dr. Zinger's last report that showed that Indigenous women are close to 50% of the incarceration rates and we're less than 5% of the population. And uh, you and I have worked on this in the past when you were with the Elizabeth Fry Society and I was general counsel at the Royal where we would face these issues where um, we had uh, Indigenous people in the system. Um, I think that education is the key. That's what I would say is, is my part of talking about Gladue principles and how these can improve uh, the process for judges to get an understanding of how 7182E of the Criminal Code and in the bail provisions, how those work. Um, how the Supreme Court of Canada sets that pace. Unfortunately, I can't comment on that. But I think, um, and I, I always repeat myself when I say this, but um, education is very important. It's uh, the key uh, at all different levels with public education, uh, with regard to the different uh, reports that have come out. I also want to mention the Vien report that talked about these issues also. But... Um, I, I think that uh, it's to have the conversation and um, unfortunately I can't comment further with regard to what the Supreme Court itself can do other than to be mindful of these issues as they appear in front of the court. Thank you for that and I'd, I'd like to ask you to reflect a bit on the, your past experience as uh, MP Adlet raised the issue of the racist and sexist uh, interpretations often of uh, information. In fact, it's the reason many of us don't even refer to Section 718 2E as Gladue factors because Ms. Gladue herself did not, was treated in such a racist and um, misogynist way. And so I'm curious as to how you, as a judge in the past, have taken those, have, have tried to bridge so that those interpretations that are often presented even by counsel. Uh, before the judge, sometimes replicated as we know by judges' decisions, how you have in the past addressed those issues and what you see going forward in terms of ways that judicial education could remedy those circumstances. Well, I think every judge and I myself have this obligation and we saw that, that in the Gladue and Ipeely decisions because we all have a role to play. I wrote about this in an article before where um, the people who appear in front of us, lawyers and ourselves. And um, I have had issues, and I've seen this more on the bail side of things, where I'll recognize a name as Indigenous from my community or from a sister community, for example, where I'll ask, and this is, uh, we see this unfortunately with self-represented accused. So I remember telling that um, man, you know, have you talked, have you told anyone that you're Indigenous? I recognize your name. And he said, well, no, I, I haven't. So I had asked duty counsel who was there to have a discussion uh, with him to educate him as to what that meant because when they're self-represented, they really just don't know. Um, and that comes back to uh, education of, of judges where it's important for everyone in the legal community, not just judges, but lawyers also, to understand what it means to represent an Indigenous person and to ask the questions, because unfortunately, at times, they'll take the client as they come and they don't ask more information other about the index offence and what happens. So I think we have an obligation in the legal system as a whole to ask the questions about the Indigenous person's background what kind of an impact did this have on the index offense and what led them to be in front of us? Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Thank you, Senator Pate. Uh, we are going back online to MP Carolyn Finlay. Thank you and uh, thank you, Justice Obon. So when it's, um, I think, a proud day for all of us to be here talking to you, whether it's in person or, per, or virtually as I am from British Columbia. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. And with that, I appreciated you saying that you see yourself as a lifelong learner, a lifelong student. Uh, certainly your degrees would bear that out, but I think you meant that much more broadly um, and a role to be played with judicial education and training that would be ongoing. So. Uh, I, I think that's very good to hear that. 
Your PhD thesis, which you defended in December of 2021, as I understand it, at the University of Ottawa is under embargo. The embargo prevents researchers from reading it to assess research competence and judicial philosophy. Um, my understanding is that to embargo a thesis is quite unusual. So could you just clarify why that was done? I think it's unusual because my understanding is um, not many judges uh, actually go through the PhD process while they're still sitting. So I think what happens is that um, when I had uh, drafted it and afterwards when it was successfully defended, um, I sat down with my supervisor and we discussed uh, what were the next steps and uh, the discussion was had to, about whether or not we should have the application for an embargo because I am a sitting judge and um, so that decision was taken at that time. Uh, will it maintain, uh, be maintained at this time? I can't really tell you. It depends as time moves forward but it was a preliminary decision given the fact that I'm still a, a sitting judge at this time. Thank you for that explanation. And uh, is there anything uh, you might want to comment about um, your thesis or the relevant research in a general way that you think may um, assist in your new role and responsibilities? Or is that not possible then? Well, I could talk to you about globally what it was about. And I looked about the history of all the different uh, uh, commissions, inquest reports that were done into G Indigenous issues, uh, how that impacted. Senator Pate asked about uh, the high rates of incarceration and how we've seen um, the government had responded in, in the mid-90s by amending the criminal code to add the specific provision of 7182E into there for judges like myself who sit at the trial courts to take into consideration the individual personal background of Indigenous accused. And then the question was, um, can we apply that in a different context looking at um, the forensic mental health system? And specifically in Ontario, there was a court of appeal decision called SIMS that talked about the fact that, and this was someone who was um, found not criminally responsible due to mental illness. He was Indigenous, and I think he was um, uh, of Cree background. And the question was, uh, what kind of a consideration should be given at the uh, review board level? So uh, the criminal code creates review boards throughout Canada that are responsible for uh, having yearly hearings to review uh, the status of unfit uh, to stand trial and uh, not criminally responsible individuals. And uh, the court had said clearly, and again uh, in the last year with a more recent decision, that there should be a, an understanding by the review boards of these principles. It's not mandatory under the provisions of the criminal code but it is very important uh, for it to be in consideration and I had looked at um, just the case law and did an analysis with regards to uh, what had occurred in uh, the last years. I think SIM came out in 2006 and it was looked to see were they considered uh, the principles and uh, what did they do with it when they were looking because they look at what kind of conditions are imposed to the person um, are they still a, a, a risk to society? Should they um, be in the system or not? So it's, it's a whole multitude of considerations. Thank you. I, I have little time left, but I appreciate you expanding on that for us and wish you every success in your, as you move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Finlay. Uh, on va rester en ligne pour le moment et passer la parole à la sénatrice Yvonne Boyer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair, and welcome, Madam Justice Obonsuen. As co-chair, and on behalf of the Indigenous Senators Working Group, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to meet with us today and to congratulate you on this historical nomination. We're beyond thrilled that one of our Indigenous sisters has been nominated to the Supreme Court of Canada. We've come a long way, but we've only really just begun. 
I'd also like to congratulate you on your recent PhD, and I'm glad you just expanded on it a little bit because that's something that I wanted to talk to you about. And I also know that the Supreme Court hears about 55% criminal law cases. So how do you see the Glad You principles blending and enhancing the access to justice for Indigenous people? And how can the Supreme Court influence the lower courts to implement these important principles? Well, I can't comment specifically on how the Supreme Court can influence, but I, I could tell you that it's definitely a consideration that's mandatory under the code, and that has to take place in, uh, when we're doing sentencing and bail hearings. So that's mandatory under the code, and it's not, uh, I may want to do it one day, depending on the facts, it may not. It's an obligation that's required of every judge who sits, especially in sentencing and uh, bail uh, hearings. Mm -hmm. I have um, I have another question that's a little bit different. And I know we've heard a lot about the Glad You principles and we've heard a lot about the sentencing and your good work. I have a question about what are the greatest challenges you've had to deal with in your career as a lawyer and a judge as an Indigenous woman and what advice you would give a 20 year old version of yourself? Be patient, patient, and more patient. <laughs> um, I, I've been very fortunate. It, it's not been an easy road. Um, I have to say a woman in labor is not easy. It's more male dominated. So that was um, something that it, 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 it takes patience and time and you work your way through the ropes. Um, so that was a, a bit different. As an Indigenous person, I've been quite fortunate, um, but I will tell you about an experience I had sitting on court <clears throat> the day after um, uh, there was a comment that uh, there was a senator in the States called uh, Pocahontas, and I was sitting in court that day. There was um, quite a few individuals. It was a long motions list, and uh, as I'm reading uh, an order, a specific order, um, I could hear a lawyer speaking to a junior lawyer, <clears throat> and at one point I hear that lawyer say, oh, she's a native Indian, she's our Pocahontas of the North. And for me, that hit me square in the forehead, and it didn't go over very well. And when um, the lawyer came up, the, not the, the one who said it, but the receiving lawyer, I put it on the record that I had just been referred to as Pocahontas of the North, and um, I took that back home to my two sons and I said, you know, this is a teaching moment because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where we are in society, we all face issues and what's important is how you deal with it and how do you have to speak out when that happens and I was happy that I put it on the record and then afterwards I, I dealt with it in other ways but I think um, how we, when these types of situations and discrimination happen to us, we have to respond and we have to make sure that we're vocal and tell them that it's not right because otherwise it just continues. Thank you. Yes, it, it does. And um, I'm thinking that uh, all of the, the work that you've juggled, the, you know, the motherhood, the being an Indigenous woman, being a lawyer and moving up on the bench is just so admirable and we're, we're very happy that you're there. So thank you. Thank you from all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Boyer. Um, we are now back in the room with NP uh, Lena Diab. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Madame la Juge, premièrement, je vous félicite. Um, C'est un honneur pour moi d'être membre de ce comité permanent de la justice et des droits de la personne et d'être un participant aujourd'hui à ce séance historique. Uh, landmark uh, avec vous comme nouvelle candidate à la Cour suprême. You are now the first Indigenous person to be nominated to Canada's highest court. And as you said, I think you probably have to frappe la tête uh, to sort of, is this real? Um, as you spoke in your introductory remarks about your upbringing, your family values, and how from an early age you said, Je veux être une avocate at a time when, to many, that would have been a nice dream to have. Um, I personally identify with a lot of 
uh, your personal background as a small girl growing up at a young age in a small rural town in Lebanon. Uh, at the age of seven, eight, and nine, I would often get asked, what do you want to be? And I always said, I want to be a lawyer, not knowing what a lawyer was, but it was, sounded good at the time. And oh, okay. <laughs> um, Moving back to Nova Scotia at the age of 11, having to, ha to learn an, a, an a English, uh, being the oldest of six, needing to, to always show that, you know, I can do it in determination, uh, and getting my education, going to law school, being admitted to the bar, at the same time having three children. So I identify with your ethics, with your family, with uh, your motherhood, I say to you the following question. What can you do now, ha being in the position you are going to be in, um, where so many people are looking at you and are proud of your achievements and are looking at themselves when they grow young or are looking at young little girls that aspire to be anywhere near that? What can you do in your position to give them hope and to give them encouragement? I think it's to do the best job as I can because if I have success, I think others have success. And um, it's to work hard, to remain humble. Um, and I think uh, I've always done this throughout my career. I speak a lot at uh, universities uh, and high schools and it's to share my story with others because I'm hoping that they'll be inspired and they'll say, well, you know, I come from a reserve in a remote area or I come from a little town where no one knows where it is or I face other adversi adversities. And I think that um, if they could be inspired to learn that if you work 110% and you put your head down, um, things can happen and, and you can make things happen. And you know, miracles happen, I'm here today. I was a long shot, so. I have to say thank you for sharing a little bit at the end about your personal life. I didn't research you as much as others. I didn't know if you had any children uh, or you know, m about your background, your father, you talked about your father, your mother, so I wanna thank you for that because it really personalizes that we are human, we have backgrounds, we have families, uh, and we, you know, we are mothers, we have to take care of our children. Um, question for you, when you retire years down the road, it's okay. I said I'm 48, right? I know, <laughs> and, and that's okay, but we have to work our way towards that. Uh, what would you like your legacy to be in the, at the Supreme Court? And what else in the many years to come can we uh, see uh, Madame Michelle Obonsoin uh, what can we hear? I hope that they'll say I'm a hard worker, I'm approachable, I'm sympathetic, and I'm a good listener. And hopefully they'll say I make sound decisions. <laughs> Merci, Madame and Madame Le Juge, and we look forward to reading those decisions. Merci. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Diab. I now turn the floor to Senator Brent Cotter. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Dean Roussy, and congratulations, Justice Abonswin, on your nomination to the Supreme Court. In the communities where I hang around, particularly in the world of legal education, your nomination is being celebrated. I should also say, parenthetically, and I hope not too flippantly, it's nice to have another left-handed judge on the Supreme Court of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is a fairly serious one, and it relates to reconciliation uh, broadly conceived, and I realize that Dean Roussy may rule me out of order at some point. Um, a story first. I taught on a number of occasions in the summer program uh, at the Indigenous Law Center at the University of Saskatchewan Law School. Visitors used to come and give lunchtime talks to soon to become law students. On one occasion, an Indigenous lawyer came and spoke about what it would be like for them when they started law school. And he used land law as an example. He said that Many people of Indigenous ancestry think about land in traditional ways, as we've heard. First, that land is fungible, that is, one piece of land is the same as any other, and that land is inalienable, that is, it's not capable of being bought or sold. But he said, when you students come to law school, you will learn that European traditions of land law 
are not just different, but the opposite. That is, each piece of land is unique. And secondly, that most of it is alienable. That is, it can be bought and sold. This was an insightful moment for me, a 30-some-year-old white guy who hadn't understood much of this at all. But it's a small example of the challenge of reconciling, reconciling indigenous conceptions of law with those of the more conventional European conceptions. And I'm not asking you to answer the land law question, and they're not even questions just for you, but also for legislators and the like. But is it possible for you to speak more generally about re reflections you have on how we should think through the challenge of reconciling I indigenous and traditional conceptions with those that are from the more conventional conceptions of law that we have? That's a bit difficult to, to answer because this is definitely a question that comes uh, or will go to the Supreme Court of Canada. And in our language, uh, land is Nakina and, and we all come from it and uh, we cherish it and it has much value in our culture. Um, what I would hope is that these concepts are well explained in the files as they go forward because as you know, we make determinations based on the, the facts, the law, the arguments as they're presented to us. And I would hope that these things that you're speaking of would form part of that to educate uh, the court. And that way there, they'll be able to make a decision based on what's been presented to them. Thanks. I have a second question that's related to education. You mentioned that communication was important particularly in fulfilling the aspirations of the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. Uh, and in that context, um, two of the calls to action call for law students in a mandatory way to be educated in Indigenous traditions and laws. Similarly, lawyers, but not judges. There's not a recommendation that calls for judges to go down that road. That respects judicial independence and, as you noted in your reference to the ethical principles for judges, some caution about judicial education being judge initiated and, and the like. But the fact that it doesn't appear in the calls to action and is not prescribed anywhere kind of invites this question about whether or not you see a potential role for yourself as championing from the inside uh, education, learning, understanding for judges so that they can do the best job they can on their courts. If you look at my application, I, I've done that since I joined the court in 2017 because for me education is the key and I'm always talking about GLADU principles, about Indigenous issues and um, I think it's essential and I, I've done that in the past and my hope is to continue talking about how Indigenous issues uh, for example with GLADU principles, how it's important that they're properly applied. Uh, at the trial level because those are key and these impact our incarceration rates, so. Thanks very much and congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotter. Um, we're going back online to MP Larry Brock. Thank you, Chair and uh, Madam Justice O'Bonsoin. It is my distinct honor and privilege to congratulate you on this marvelous achievement. Uh, my writing is from Brantford Brant in Ontario, uh, also home of the largest population wise of the largest indigenous uh, uh, nation in Canada, that being Six Nations of the Grand River. So on behalf of the Six Nations and my writing, we sincerely congratulate you. Thank you. In my former career as a Crown Attorney, I had the distinct honor and privilege to actively participate in prosecutions in indigenous people's court. I did that for a number of years and I know that you've made reference uh, to that Indigenous uh, People's Court in your home jurisdiction uh, prior to your appointment and I know that from time to time we hear various courts across this great country also speak about their efforts to resurrect Indigenous People's Courts. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on mandating that uh, from a judicial perspective, what you think about mandating that every province should have Indigenous People's Courts. I'd like your thoughts on that. And secondly, ways to improve the participation in that courts outside of the traditional format where a person can only attend that court where they want to accept responsibility and expanding that to the trial division and even expanding that into civil and family court. Thank you. Thank you for 
your question, Mr. Brock. Uh, undoubtedly, um, Madam Justice will be uh, limited in her comments, but perhaps she can offer some, some general comments on the issues that you raise. So with regards to mandating it, unfortunately, I can't provide uh, much opinion with regard to that. That's definitely uh, a legislative and social more aspect, uh, not for someone in my position to opine on. Uh, about who should be involved in, in those. Because I haven't uh, worked extensively uh, with the, the Indigenous People's Court and it's um, not in my purview, I can't provide you much more information uh, by way of an answer with regard to that. I'm sorry. Okay. You spoke in one of your responses to one of my colleagues regarding your thoughts on the, the access to justice being greatly improved as a result of a byproduct of the pandemic. But there's also a negative aspect that I want to explore with you. Uh, with the reduction in access to legal aid in many parts of Canada, there has been an increase in the evidence, sorry, incidents of unrepresented accused and litigants before the court. What, if any, concerns do you have regarding that development, and do you have any thoughts about what could be done? I can't provide an opinion with regard to that, but I can say that um, unrepresented individuals in front of us um, is, is not, uh, a lot of times I would say is not the best for those individuals because they don't have the legal expertise to know how to navigate through the system. And I think it's essential uh, for those who appear in any level of court, and it could be on a family member a matter, like it could be on a criminal matter. I don't think it makes a difference, but I think that representation, uh, if possible, is definitely uh, beneficial to that individual to understand what his, what his or her rights are and how the procedure should move forward. Thank you. In your questionnaire, you stated, quote, I have also seen how different Indigenous perspectives can be from the colonial history of much of the Canadian population, while still recognizing and embracing all our unique perspectives, which are the fabric of our country. You also noted a Supreme Court of Canada justice comes with a variety of experiences and expertise that necessarily informs without interfering with their responsibility to be impartial and independent. This is key to all judicial positions, but more importantly to the Supreme Court of Canada. Can you elaborate on those thoughts? And secondly, how should the distinct perspectives and life experiences of justices on the court inform their work given their responsibility to be impartial? I think at the end of the day, our first role is as a, a judge who's impartial. And our backgrounds uh, all inform how uh, we live and how we uh, perceive things. And I don't think we can get a, away from that. But I think that um, it's our obligation to be impartial. Our backgrounds will sometimes educate our decisions, but I don't think they're the, necessarily the driving force that lead us to fall a certain way on, on matters that are before us. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brock. Um, we on va rester en ligne un instant. Uh, la parole est à la sénatrice Bernadette Clément. Bonjour, Madame la Juge. Sego. Hello. I wish I could be in the room with you. Uh, but I, I do want to tell you that I'm in my home community of Cornwall and that that is located on the traditional territory of the Mohawk people of Akwesasne. Je vous ai entendu dire dans votre discours d'ouverture, regardez-moi bien aller. Ça témoigne uh, d'une attitude qui vibre et ça témoigne d'une persévérance. Alors, uh, Pour cela, je vous remercie et je vous offre toutes mes félicitations ce matin. Euh, et je le dis avec un sourire. J'espère que vous entendez le sourire dans ma voix. Vous ne voyez pas, mais je suis en train de sourire. I have two questions. Uh, one is about um, your work as a legal clinic lawyer. If you could um, explain how your work as a legal clinic lawyer has shaped um, your career in law. And the second question is about being the first. So being the first is, of course, a place of great honor, but it can be a place of great pressure, 
a place of vulnerability, especially when you are um, in such a high profile uh, job that, that might take you away from your community at times, away from uh, your source of, of strength and comfort. So I wonder if you could speak about how, how you've managed that. This is not the first time that you're the first. So how you navigate uh, your role as a lawyer, your role as a first, which means that there's pressure to be absolutely perfect, but also that you probably have a need to inspire because you want to make sure that you're not the last. So two questions. So I'll start off with uh, your first one with regards to my uh, experience at uh, the University of Ottawa Legal Clinic. So at that time, it's when I was a law student in French common law where um, I volunteered to uh, work in that clinic. So at the time, it was to, if I remember correctly, um, just to assist uh, individuals who were appearing in first appearance court uh, for remand in provincial criminal court. So it was just to help them prepare for that appearance. Um, with regard to um, my second part of my uh, experience working there, when I was a counsel at Canada Post Corporation, I also worked there uh, at the University of Ottawa, again, legal clinic. I worked there part-time as a file reviewer. So I would go in after hours and on weekends to review all the files of the students to ensure that they were properly filling out the paperwork and um, to make sure that they were asking the right questions and looking down uh, the right paths to move forward. So mm -hmm. that was really my more limited role with regard to uh, the legal aid clinic at the university. Um, with regard to being a first, I have to admit I'm far from perfect. Um, I, it's not easy always being a first because you're, you're under a microscope at times, but um, I've learned that uh, how to go about it is just to be hardworking, uh, do the best that I can with my background and my experience, um, to remain humble, listen well, um, be collegial with others because uh, collegial, sorry, with others because at the end of the day, um, if I if I do uh, get this nomination, uh, it's working with eight other individuals on a day in day out basis, and I think that uh, as you heard, I'm in it for the long haul, so I definitely uh, want to get along and play well with others. So. Those are the things that uh, I, I will do to make sure that uh, hopefully I'm successful in my role there. And how do I manage the pressure? Well, on weekends, I spend time with my family, I paint, and I play with those dogs. <laughs> on vous remercie uh, et on va vous regarder aller. Alors, je vous félicite, uh, Madame la Juge. Merci beaucoup. Niawa, thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Sénatrice Clément. Uh, on revient uh, dans la salle. The next question comes from MP uh, Gary Ananda Sangari. Thank you, uh, moderator. I want to uh, begin by uh, thanking the Independent Advisory Board as well as uh, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General, the Honorable David Lametti, for their hard work in getting us here. I also want to thank the many staff that have been involved in this process uh, for the last several months. I'm delighted to join my colleagues here on this historical day, particularly MPs Batiste and Idlut, uh, and I'm honored to share this moment, uh, this very powerful moment with them uh, as we see this historical first. Madam Justice uh, Obonsuin, uh, congratulations on your nominations to the Supreme Court of Canada. I recognize the weight of history that you carry on your shoulders today, being nominated as the first Abenaki member of the Odenak First Nation, more broadly the first Indigenous person, 89th Justice of the Supreme Court, and only the 11th woman and a linguistic minority from rural Northern Ontario. You bring to this role an exceptional set of credentials and a lived experience like no other. Madam Justice, several years ago you said the following, and I quote, when I was in high school I met with my guidance counselor and I told him that I was going to be a lawyer, and he said, Well, Michelle, you come from a small French town in northern Ontario. That's likely not to happen. So you should maybe change your career path. And I had decided, no, this is what I'm going to do. Watch me. 
So, Madam Justice, to this guidance counselor and to all others, <laughs> to all others who guide our children and to our children who may have doubts about their abilities, what do you want to tell them today? Listen to those that come to you and be supportive because at the end of the day, all of us as students, we thrive and all we want is the support of our teachers. And uh, to be mindful because what teachers say to children and to teens have long lasting impacts. And uh, you know, I had difficulties, let's say, with that issue, but I had uh, Ms. Claire Fournier, my teacher in grade 10 and grade 12, who said, you could do it, pursue your dreams, you're going to be a lawyer. And I have to tell you, last Friday, she actually left me a message on my voicemail to congratulate me. So be mindful, your words have impacts on students' lives and um, they could be detrimental if they're negative. So always try to be positive. Um, in terms of the Supreme Court, it's, uh, it's an institution that's deeply rooted in history and, and albeit uh, colonial history. Um, what will you do to um, enact changes within the system? And I'm not talking the process, I'm talking about um, the level of comfort that individual litigants, the access to justice um, that those from particularly underrepresented groups uh, may have. So what, what would you do? What, how would you leave your mark in the Supreme Court that will essentially allow it to be opened up? First, I'll get there. <laughs> um, but I think what's important is to, um, to just be myself. Um, I've gone to where I am today by being myself and not changing along the way. And uh, I would expect that if I'm fortunate to be named to the Supreme Court, um, to continue to act the same way, to be respectful of others, uh, because how do we lead change is by being thoughtful and, and respectful, and I, I think that's how we do it. So on the on the day that uh, you know you described the microaggression that uh, that you faced, and I'm sure you've you faced it many times in your life, um, when you when when that when those two lawyers had a conversation uh, and and and. Uh, identified you as, as, as someone, um, how do you deal with that personally? Like how do you overcome it and how do you keep your um, professionalism but at the same time how do you deal with that on a very personal level so that you're not um, sidelined by that, um, that experience? Well I think it's uh, being a judge is you're impartial to the core and um, at the end of the day, it's like when we render a decision and we read the newspaper that slams us because we made the wrong decision according to the news. Um, we don't react publicly. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it's just important to, um, to remember what our role is and uh, not to deviate from that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ananda Sangari. Uh, we are going back online for the next question from MP Karen Vecchio. Thank you very much. And it is truly an honor to be able to be on this panel and to speak to you today, Madam Justice. Uh, I have had the honor to be sitting on the status of women and working with some incredible people across Canada, organizations that are really talking about victims and looking at victims' rights. And uh, we have seen, uh, we had Bill C-28, I know we're not going to talk about legislation, but that had to do with the extreme intoxication. We also saw some really powerful bills go through the House of Commons over the last few uh, sessions, including uh, a discussion on Ron Ambrose bill, which in the, gov the Liberal government has taken over and, and did incorporate it into what we're doing for training, and then the domestic violence bill brought forward by Andrew Dillon. I have noted that you have done lots and lots of extracurricular learning, and, and that is, I'm very, very grateful for that. And as you indicated, that our backgrounds will inform our decisions. Sometimes that is my greatest concern. What do you think you can do within the Supreme Court to make sure that this training continues and that people are there so we're advocating on behalf of victims? Well, I could just say for myself is um, I will continue um, educating people with regards to our uh, our system. And you've heard um, Justice Wagner is a huge promo proponent 
of um, education and of uh, talking about what the role of the court, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada is. And I would hope uh, with discussion, to have discussions with him to, to continue to, to fulfill that role because um, I'm a, a huge proponent and, and supporter of education to the legal profession, not only to judges, but to lawyers and law students also. I really do appreciate that. We've just uh, finished up at some round tables talking to victims, and I want to ensure that the victim's voice is being heard. Are there any other things that you would recommend that could be done to assist victims when they're going through the Supreme Court system? Sorry, at the top of the, my head, I can't think of anything further, no. No, I do appreciate that. When it comes to judges training, uh, we have seen different things and perhaps, I, I'm, as you said, you have a, a background that so many don't have that are sitting there. What else could we do to ensure that judges are willing to take that training? It's hard to answer that. I think it's just to continue to have uh, the discussions about uh, how things can improve and, and uh, sorry, I don't really know what, what further I could tell you about that. No, I, I do appreciate that. As I said, with the, when I'm looking at victims, that is what is coming to the uh, forefront, ensuring that victims are always being heard. So I, I'm looking at different things. You had talked earlier about uh, being able to, I think it was in your opening statements, when the fact that uh, if you want to be away from your perpetrator, that there is a, a way of protecting the victims. So I'm looking at things like that and anything that you would think of that could make that better for victims. So when we're talking, I, I can switch over to the mental health side. Uh, when we're looking at mental mental health, um, how would you see that um, court systems, we've talked about the indig Indigenous courts, is there something better that we can be doing to ensure that mental health is, is being taken into consideration when we're, or when we are uh, going through the court system or sentencing somebody? I don't think it's necessarily something better, but it's just to be mindful about it, about its existing, its existence, and to ask those questions. So I, I think we have an obligation as judges especially more though at the the trial level i would probably say where these files uh, would more mostly originate to ask those mm -hmm. questions yeah absolutely and and just looking at your background when we're talking about the different things uh what type of law did you you, you did some legal counsel so obviously some corporate law did you did, you did some criminal law what other kind of law did you practice so just to let you know, I didn't do corporate law. So I've uh, oh, okay. So I was sorry. I was looking at the so legal counsel. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, I, I I don't I mean have to sound to, that way. Sorry. Sorry, I have to say I'm a bit of an oddball compared to other Supreme Court uh, people. I would say because I I've always had a career in house as an in house counsel. So when I started off at Canada Post, uh, I traveled extensively throughout Canada to do labor and employment files and and human rights. I was also responsible to uh, respond to privacy and access to information requests because um, when I was there, the uh, the minister uh, had two responsible for Canada Post was also responsible, I think maybe for public works or, or something, I can't recall. So I, I took care of that. And when I got to the Royal, uh, I was brought in because of my labor experience because they had uh, three unions in Ottawa and two in Brockville. Um, and then also, so I continued uh, with the labor employment, then began with the mental health. Um, and uh, I also managed uh, the access to information department uh, at uh, the Royal. Awesome. Thank you very much, Madam Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vecchio. So we um, are going to stay online for this uh, last question online um, from MP Mike Morris. Thank you, moderator. I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples on block two of the Haldeman Tract. And Madam Justice Obansawin, it is an honor to join in congratulating you on your nomination to the Supreme Court. This is truly and deeply historic. You spoke in your opening remarks about the different paths that um, folks have come from to the Supreme Court. And I feel like your responses this afternoon particularly to uh, uh, Senator Pate on the overrepresentation of Indigenous uh, incarcerated women and MP Idlout on Indigenous languages demonstrates the importance of someone with your voice and your experience and your path uh, being nominated to the Supreme Court. I wonder if you could share a story or a reflection 
on what you feel needs to be done to ensure that others more quickly follow in your footsteps? Boy, that's a big question. Um, I guess it just, uh, if you're asking what I, I myself would do, is just to continue talking about my journey and sharing with others. So hopefully that they could see a bit of themselves in my journey and say, hey, I could do that too. So um, I think it's to continue having discussions and meeting people and um, I've never shied away from a good conversation with anyone and my, uh, my kids always laugh because when I walk down the streets, I say hello to everyone and I talk to their dogs. And so it's just to continue as I've always been. Thank you for that. I, it, it strikes me um, when I speak with Indigenous community members here, there are folks who are still uncomfortable self-identifying as Indigenous when applying for housing, for example. And, and so I contrast that with the significance of the conversation we're in the midst of this afternoon. And it makes me wonder, you know, there's a lot of um, folks who are watching this afternoon. What might you say to, um, to someone like that? Um, what, what, um, what would you offer or reflect back to them as, uh, as someone in your shoes this, this afternoon? I think that um, what I, I would say to them is our, our culture and our heritage nourish us and it's always um, a, a good idea and a recommended, I would say, to find out where we're from because it helps us determine where we're going in the future. So uh, to ask the questions about uh, if there's Indigenous heritage and to learn to reach out to the community if they're attached to a community, to get involved in the community, to work with elders, because I think that um, as an Indigenous person, uh, we have... Um, we have just great pride and it's important to, if we can to, to all feel that pride as Indigenous people. Thanks for that. I, I want to just close by sharing how much I appreciate in your, um, in your submission how uh, openly you shared about your own childhood. You're talking about not coming from a privileged background, talking about part-time jobs, babysitting in, in retail, uh, to move to uh, the point you're at this afternoon as a result of the humility you've spoken about, the hard work you've spoken about. And uh, for, all, for all of that, I just uh, um, wanna thank, thank you uh, again. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morris. Um, as I mentioned, that was the last online question. Now we have the last um, question here in the room. Last but not least, um, from MP Yasser Nagvi. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dean Lucy. Madam Justice, congratulations. Uh, uh, thank you for sustaining all these questions uh, over last uh, uh, hour and a half or almost two hours. Now, I, I also have two children, so I'm not going to seek your guidance about pets. It's, it's just going to get me into trouble. Because you're going to finish with chickens and cats yeah, and dogs. Yeah, that's exactly why I'm not going to seek your guidance. So, <laughs> we have one rabbit, and we're having difficulty man managing that. <laughs> um, but given the, the historic nomination, uh, your nomination to, to Supreme Court of Canada, um, I have been having conversations with my children uh, about that. And uh, my 10-year-old son's reaction has been, oh, Canada, it's about time. <laughs> he seriously said that. And my six-year-old daughter is just quite excited for the girl judge. Her words, not mine. So I just wanted to share that um, uh, with you. But in all seriousness, I do want to ask you, in your view, what does your appointment mean for Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous Canadians uh, moving forward? Well, I, I hope it would um, tell them that, that anything is possible. If you put your mind to it, you work 100%. I, sorry I'm at the risk of repeating what I've said previously, but uh, I hope that it inspires others to, to believe that you can get there and um, to, so, to seek out people that could help them along the way because as I've talked about before, mentorship and even friendships have helped me along the way and made me the person I am today and made me the, the lawyer and the judge I am today. So I've been fortunate uh, throughout my life and my career to have those people and to have a very strong 
family that supported me and my parents and my grandmother and, and my husband and my kids, so. Great, thank you. Um, we've discussed a lot today about, obviously, Canadian judicial landscape and, and your role as, as a lawyer and, and as, a, as a judge. Um, but Canada plays an important role internationally as well when it comes to promoting rule of law, access to justice, um, independence of judiciary, and Canadian judges play an important role in that regards as well. It's my understanding that you have been involved in, in training judges, especially uh, women judges in Afghanistan. Can you share that experience with us? Um, what did you learn? Um, uh, how do you see that particular aspect uh, as you become uh, a judge of the Supreme Court of Canada um, uh, internationally from, from Canadian perspective? I've been fortunate along the way because I've sat on, well, as you've seen from my application, I've spoken at a lot of conferences and I've sat on panels with amazing women and, and men and when I sit on those panels, I share my knowledge, but I also am lucky uh, to gain knowledge from those that are on the panel with me. But what I love even the most though is after the conference is done. I have often had, um, uh, women, lawyers, uh, even students come up and talk to me afterwards and, and ask me about my journey and, and uh, some of them who uh, I had taken under my wing from having met at conferences and I'm proud to say one of them was na named to the federal court in, in the past couple of months so um, I hope that I share with them and I, I have to tell you I've learned a lot from them also uh, those I have, who have sat on panels with me, but those that I've met afterwards. That's uh, pretty. That's pretty remarkable. Once again, congratulations. Uh, we look forward to all of us. Look forward to uh, watching uh, your uh, career move forward as an esteemed judge of our our Supreme Court, and look forward to reading groundbreaking decisions that will ensure more equality, equity, and uh, breaking down systemic barriers in our country. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Merci, Uliuni. Thank you, Mr. Nagvi. So that concludes the question and answer period. J'aimerais maintenant inviter Madame la juge Obansoen à nous adresser quelques mots de clôture. I'm just wondering my notes. I don't see them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll be brief, je serai vraiment pas longue. Nadala Kim Magok, Nagon Sozak, Adoti, Melihidit, Wawadon, Dam Wangan, Noliuni, Kawan, Mziwi, Awani, Nodawit. I'm grateful to my ancestors for giving me wisdom today. I thank everyone who took the time to listen to me. Je suis reconnaissante envers mes ancêtres de m'avoir donné la sagesse d'aujourd'hui. Je remercie à tous ceux et celles qui ont été très patients. Je sais c'est long, mais j'apprécie beaucoup euh, votre, euh, que vous étiez ici avec moi et les questions que vous avez me, me demandé. Donc, merci beaucoup, Ulini. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Juge. This brings this special session to a close. Thank you to all parliamentarians for your participation today. Thank you to all those present in the room for your attention. And thank you to all Canadians watching us or listening to us from coast to coast to coast for your interest in this very important process. It has been an immense pleasure and honor for me to serve as moderator for this occasion. Madame la juge Bonsoin, merci pour votre participation aujourd'hui. Toutes nos félicitations encore une fois et nous vous souhaitons le meilleur pour la suite des choses. Bonne fin de journée à toutes et à tous.